I'm going to hand over to Cliff Hughes in a minute. Uh, thanks, Karen, and can I extend my welcome to you uh, here at the CEC tonight? It's good to have you here. <clears throat> a couple of words. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about the CEC. Hopefully, you know who we are and what we do. If not, just uh, look around you and uh, uh, come back one day and we can fill you in on, on the work of the CEC. Do you want to say a few words about ISCA before I introduce our guests? Uh, ISCA is the International Society for Quality Assurance in Healthcare. Uh, it has been uh, in uh, operation now for over 25 years. Actually, it goes back so far that we're not quite sure when the records began, but it's around about 25 years, perhaps 27 at, at the most. Uh, interestingly, it was founded by the work of a number of Australians, uh, including Chris Brook from um, uh, Victoria, amongst others, uh, who saw the need to have a, an international body that looked at issues of concern and particularly recognised the emerging area of accreditation uh, as something that needed to have international uh, collaboration and consistency. And for many years, the Secretariat of ISCO was run out of uh, Melbourne uh, and uh, grew into a uh, organisation which now reaches into over 100 countries around the world. Um, it focuses uh, strongly on safety and the quality of care that we provide to our patients. Uh, it has a very strong flavour that is known as patient-centred or patient-based care. Uh, and of course, it maintains its uh, crucial interest in accreditation uh, and is, if you like, um, in a three-word statement, the accreditors of the accreditors. So it is an international group that looks at the way in which accrediting agents work against standards that either they themselves have set uh, or their local jurisdictions may have set. And that area is growing quite rapidly, particularly in some of the emerging and uh, lower income countries around the world as they seek to improve their healthcare services and have been looking for ways to do that. Uh, and, and they've recognised that having a standard that is expected of management, uh, of uh, governance and also of the clinicians is a very important driving fo force for accreditation uh, internationally. Uh, so we're doing work uh, in places like Nigeria, and we've had meetings in Ghana, we're working in the Middle East, our conference in two years' time will be in Qatar, uh, we've worked uh, in China, uh, we have strong links to Taiwan, uh, into Burma and to other countries uh, as well. So um, we reach around the globe and we try and educate people uh, into uh, some of these topics and therein lies our first problem which is why you're here tonight. The first problem is that it's very hard to find a time that suits clinicians and managers uh, around the world to get together to discuss an issue. Because the officers moved to Europe a few years ago, many of the activities take place around the time zones uh, that uh, suited Europe in particular and uh, North America and Canada as well and left Australians struggling uh, to go to meetings at 11 o'clock at night uh, or at 5 a.m. in the morning and Tim and some of the others in the audience uh, know the pain that that uh, causes not only to us uh, at the meeting but to the family and indeed to the family dogs <laughs> sometimes when you're trying to have a meeting in the middle of the night. So we've started to embark upon a series of regional programs uh, and Australia is actually leading that process uh, and the purpose of a regional uh, program is to have something that we can do on our time frame so we can have face-to-face -face meetings so we can have a much greater participatory audience uh, on the uh, on the web uh, and at the same time record the events to be distributed to the other audiences around the world and, and we hope eventually that for those in Europe who do want to get up at 11 o'clock at night they can certainly join us online with webinars uh, and the like. <coughs> So uh, you're, a, you're an experiment. You're the first cow off the rank. Uh, it's not randomised, it's not controlled. Uh, we've sent out a special of interest uh, so that we actually got the enthusiasts so we can maximise the Hawthorne effect. Um, but we've also looked uh, at the topic and we've picked a topic that we knew was uh, causing a, a great deal of interest in Australia, uh, namely accreditation particularly with the rollout of the 10 national standards for safety and quality. And we've also chosen a number of uh, speakers who we believe will uh, stir your thoughts, and I'll come back to introduce them just in a moment. But I thought you might like to know that if you turn to the Oxford uh, Dictionary and look up 
accreditation and accredited, you get a whole lot of things and you wonder how on earth does that to fit into health, health system delivery. <coughs> uh, to accredit is to attribute to a person. Doesn't really fit. To credit a person with saying something. Well, we say a lot of things in health, don't we? With credentials or to recommend by documents as an envoy, someone who is charged with standing up on behalf of somebody else. To gain belief or influence for or make credible an advisor a statement. There's strange words around accreditation. And I thought, well, maybe that's because the um, people who devised it didn't read English. Instead, they actually wrote, wrote their own manuals. Uh, and for those of you that haven't had the opportunity, can I refer you to the Hospital Accreditation Workbook, which was put out a, a year and a half ago by <coughs> the Australian Commission, which defines really what they are talking about when they talk about accreditation. Uh, and they also list the details around each of the standards. They say, and I quote, the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare has developed this accreditation workbook to assist hospitals to determine if they meet the requirements of the National Safety Health Service or uh, standards. These standards were endorsed by the Health Minister, the Australian Health Minister in 2011 and provide a clear statement about the level of care consumers can expect from health service organisations. They also play an essential part in new accreditation arrangements under the Australian Health Services Safety and Quality Accreditation Scheme. The workbook, and therefore the process, focuses on accreditation. That is, it outlines the key steps in an accreditation process. So accreditation is a process, not a policy and provides examples of evidence that could be used to demonstrate that the standards have been met. So it's evidence-based and it does require measurement against known standards. And I hope you all know that there are 10 standards um, and these postcards have been circulated widely by the Australian Commission. I'd have to say if I was the Australian Commission I wouldn't be sending a postcard of capsules or tablets that might suggest that accreditation is a bitter pill to swallow, which they all grow. But it is actually a very good way of actually being aware of what the standards are, because you will find that those in the know keep talking about standard one or standard seven or standard nine, and you got to think now, which one's which? Let me tell you that standard one is governance. And uh, for that reason, uh, we've asked somebody with expertise in governance to come and join with us tonight. <clears throat> so it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Stephen Leader to you. Uh, Stephen and I go back far longer than either of us care to remember, and we've had some interesting discussions um, uh, over our careers on uh, whether public health is more important than cardiac surgery. That remains undetermined uh, as yet, but we'll continue that discussion for a long time to come. But also on what it means to deliver a safe and effective healthcare to our patients. Uh, Stephen is here in his role as chair of the board uh, of uh, Western Sydney Local Health District uh, and he's going to put the perspective uh, of governance to the debate. But any system that's going to look at accreditation needs to be managed well. So we needed to have a chief executive on board and it's also my privilege to introduce another <coughs> friend and colleague uh, in Danny O'Connor. Uh, who chairs, uh, who is the chief executive of the same local health district. And we thought if we got people from the same environment, we could lessen friction. It possibly may have increased the friction, but we'll let uh, Western Sydney sort that one out later on. Um, and uh, perhaps you can help adjudicate. The way we're going to work things this afternoon is each speaker is going to have a chance to make an opening statement uh, of around about three to five minutes. And then we're going to uh, let each of the, the uh, debaters ask each other some uh, explanatory questions, and then we're going to open it up for you uh, to pose questions of either or of the speakers. Uh, and we want to make this a truly interactive program. Uh, it is being filmed, uh, so if you don't want to be filmed, we understand that you may not. Please uh, sit at the back, uh, and uh, we'll um, take your comments anonymously. Uh, uh, if that uh, helps you, feel free to speak up. It is important that we air our points of view 
uh, that we are trying to understand each other's perspective uh, on what is the emerging issue, not only in Australia, uh, but around the globe in established organisations and countries such as the United States, the UK and Europe, uh, but also in the emerging nations of Southeast Asia, uh, the Indian subcontinent, uh, Africa uh, and indeed Oceania. And as well as that, we recognise that accreditation has impact on managers, on clinicians, and most of all, on patients. So with that introduction, I'm going to hand over uh, to our speakers to talk about the issues of accreditation. They can put their definition on what they wish to talk about as well. Um, but I'm going to ask uh, Stephen Leader if he'd like to speak to us first. Stephen, feel free to sit there and talk. That microphone should pick up the voice OK, as long as you don't uh, bang the table too loudly. Uh, and um, then we'll ask Danny to, uh, to respond. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cliff, and um, good evening, everybody. Very nice to see you all. Many familiar faces, many warriors to improve quality, and a few of you bearing flesh wounds and scars, I'm <laughs> sure, from the, the fray. The, uh, it's interesting that uh, <coughs> local health districts are almost exactly two years old, and uh, that followed some resolutions taken by all of the Australian health care ministers. And almost exactly two years ago also, the, uh, the national standards for safety and quality were promulgated. So it gives you an idea in terms of governance the, the importance placed by the, the ministers for health and especially the Commonwealth Government's reform agenda on uh, accreditation, safety and quality, that it was right up there when health networks were being discussed, when the relative contributions of Commonwealth and State to hospital and community funding were being debated, quality was right up there. That's not always been the case. And certainly um, reflecting back to some of those early years when Cliff and I were still wearing shorts, uh, white ones maybe, uh, as interns, uh, there wasn't there wasn't much, very little formal emphasis on on quality matters, and it wasn't for lack of hospital boards. Certainly at North Shore Hospital, uh, we had um, a hospital board was um, chaired by Sir Norman Knock of Knock and Kirby's hardware store. So you can imagine um, what sort of uh, ethos he brought to the board. And one of his um, famous edicts was when John Yeo was proposing that they develop a spinal injuries unit at North Shore Hospital. But he didn't want it because he didn't want people in wheelchairs around his hospital. So his notion of quality was a wheelchair-free hospital, thank you. None of these spinal injured individuals. That's governance at its unbridled best. So, um, but it is an interesting thing that having moved from, from a point of uh, inferiority, uh, and I can remember the early days when Lionel Wilson was battling away for accreditation systems against his colleagues in the AMA, a bloody battle. Um, it's moved from that now to a point where when the health ministers gather and they talk about the governance of the system, they say, yeah, safety and quality really matter. Thank you, National Agency, for your standards. We sign up on those. <coughs> we expect everybody to be accountable in ch achieving those. It's part of the deal. Those of us who hold a candle for prevention uh, look on enviously about the way in which accreditation and quality have actually achieved an institutional significance that means that you can't govern anything much in the healthcare system these days without attending to matters of quality and safety and to the formalities of accreditation. So I don't want anybody here who's in the trade, the profession, to feel, oh, nobody loves us or takes any notice of us, because uh, you guys have done really well. 
and I think we should take some pleasure in, in what's been achieved through uh, processes like the accreditation system. I know people complain and say it focuses too much on <coughs> process and structure and not enough on outcome, and I share that comment, but my goodness, it's a jolly good start. And uh, Cliff was reciting before the various nations into which accreditation has begun to percolate, but um, <coughs> lots of lots of countries where accreditation remains and quality and safety concerns remain an absolutely unaffordable luxury. So you should feel good if you're in the accreditation and quality safety business uh, that you're in something that's well endorsed as part of governance of contemporary healthcare in Australia and very privileged. So that's just my introductory homily for the evening. Um, in Western Sydney, we uh, not a single member of the board that you could pin against the wall and say, you uninterested in quality of healthcare, there wouldn't be anybody. And their, their passionate interest in that is largely what leads them to get onto the board. It's not the finer details of healthcare financing. I mean, some people find that remarkably interesting, but nevertheless, the primary motivation to be there is to do the best you possibly can uh, to oversee the provision of healthcare, which includes making as sure as we can that the processes are put in place to assure the quality of it. We have quality and safety committee, we have leads in each of the major um, facilities around each of the ten um, goals for the national standards. And um, I guess from, from the perspective of governance, the big question that, that we have in our mind, which features as a fatal flaw in uh, many of the inquiries into abject failures of hospital care, Staffordshire, and so on, is how well are we connecting our concern about safety and quality to that which the clinicians have and in which they operate. And uh, that, that's a kind of conversation, a kind of question that can only really be answered, in my view, by uh, fronting up into the clinical setting seeing what's happening. I think one of the most damning lines in the review of the Mid-Staffordshire crisis was one that said, if the board members had ventured into the wards, they would have smelt the urine. And it's that detachment um, which can happen subtly between people sitting at a governance level thinking wise thoughts about accreditation and safety and what's actually happening, that creates a space for a disaster. Now that's exceptional. Uh, but much more, I think, to the point is the concern that some of our clinicians express, that accreditation and quality assessment and the rest of it involves reams of paper, tick boxes, and doesn't really confront the clinical reality of the service that they're providing. And that connectivity is, is incredibly important. And uh, Danny and I were drawing an analogy before the meeting this evening between meeting the clinicians around a quality agenda and meeting the clinicians around an agenda of implementing ICT. Because if you don't invest in the change management in the person-to-person -person contact, then empirical studies will demonstrate quite clearly that you'll end up failing to achieve your goals. So we're fortunate in Sydney that uh, we've got clinicians who keep us honest on the board, who are interested in quality, who can translate the governance commitment to conversations with clinical colleagues so that good things follow. So um, accreditation and safety quality all fit very tightly into uh, 
uh, the governance structures that I think Australia at the moment possesses. I think we're at a good time to see real progress. And I'll uh, leave it to Danny to talk more about the, the sort of managerial side of this. But um, it's, a, it, it, it's quite a good scene. Thanks, Dick. Danny. Uh, thanks, Cliff. Hello, everyone. <coughs> Just um, by way of introduction, I've been involved in managing health services since uh, 1994, and um, I was a surveyor with the ACHS, the Australian Council on Healthcare Standards, for 10 years, between um, 2001 and 2011. So I really come to this conversation with an immense amount of respect for the accreditation movement, and with an immense amount of respect for the people who have been involved in pushing the agenda over the last 10 and 20 years to get quality and safety and a commitment to achieving standards around the way in which we run our health services and the way in which we treat our patients and provide them with <coughs> good experience. I have immense respect for that movement and the people who have been involved in that work uh, over the time that I've been familiar with. Um, but, but Cliff, Cliff asked me to come along tonight for the purpose of having a conversation in part about how solid are the building blocks that we stand upon at the, at the moment in relation to accreditation, particularly as they relate to safety and quality. And what does the future hold in terms of this movement and this part of the business? Uh, 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 if we see this as a central part of the business, how confident are we going forward that uh, we'll do as well as we can? And I've got to say, if I think about my time since 1994, and if I think about my 10 years surveying, as I said, surveyed with some of the most expert uh, and capable people, when I think about those things, I think that in large part, accreditation has been a management task and a management issue. It's in large part been driven by a management imperative. It's la in large part, uh, 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 it's been in large part management that has derived most of the benefits from accreditation. Now, I said, for, I said in large part, certainly not entirely, and, and I don't mean to say that all of the effort that we've put in and all of the work that we've done hasn't uh, uh, driven direct and indirect benefits in the way in which we design and operate and deliver care. But I do believe that the emphases and the processes that we have become used to have in large part been driven by a management imperative and have yielded primarily management rewards. Cliff, my concern going forward is that, is that I, I, I actually think that whilst the new standards in Australia have really sharpened the focus on safety and quality, have really sharpened the focus on the relationship between the institution and the experience of care, I think our game, I think our industry significantly lags behind other industries in much more assertively uh, dealing with the safety agenda uh, for people receiving the service that they deliver and also the people involved in delivering the service that they deliver. I, I actually think that we need to take a much sharper focus in our industry in aligning the uh, performance uh, requirements of the individuals and groups within, the, within our organisation to the safety and quality agenda, and in fact, making sure that we've got the incentives and the disincentives around performance as they relate to the safety and quality agenda much sharper than they are now. So that, that's where my head's at around this at the moment. Fine. Stephen, do you want to ask any questions of Danny? 
Um, yeah, I think that I think I can see what Danny's driving at. Um, there's there's a huge amount still to be done. Um, whether this will be done before we take the development of um, a comprehensive um, ICT strategy seriously or not, I don't know. I mean, it's, um, when I've seen good quality, high quality systems operating in other places, notably in California and Boston, um, they have they made maximal use of, of information and although there's a lot of information around in our system at the moment it's not it's not coordinated in any contemporary way I'd estimate we're probably 20 years behind best practice with regard to the information that we collect and utilize um, and that makes the sharpening the sharpening of the pointy end that Danny's talking about difficult to achieve. Um, give you one one example. Both Danny and I have seen Kaiser Permanente operating in California. There are millions of enrollees. It's a managed care system, single payer, unified um, information system that will looks after the patient, the staff, the money, the planning of hospital safety, quality, the whole caboodle. And each week, a clinical unit, say, of gastroenterologists will meet with data pertaining to infection rates, length of stay, and all the rest of it. Patients managed by that unit over the week for review among the team. And you know, underperforming people are identified. And as, uh, as, as the head of the department said when I confronted him with these, you know, what happens? He said, well, Generally speaking, the people um, lift their game. And I said, if they don't, he said, well, a lot of people out there waiting to get a job at Kaiser Permanente. So there's real accountability built into it. No, this is no giggle. You give them the flick to have your future freed up on the basis of information about your clinical performance. Now, that's a micro level thing. But but that's not technologically difficult, as Danny says. A lot of this stuff goes on day after day. I mean, any precision manufacturing industry has quality data that, that are governing the, the, the manufacture of components that is far superior to anything we, we, we apply. So there's a huge amount of ground yet to be covered. And, and I think personally, until we accept the necessity for making use of clinical information in making informed judgments about quality and sheeting that home and making it available to clinicians, then the process will remain fragmented and different and, and, and less satisfactory than it could be. Now, you could mount an argument against me and say, well, there's some really good clinical safety and quality systems that are operated by people using pencils, writing things down on pieces of paper. Yes, there are. And we should not ignore those. And waiting the grand day when we get a proper ICT system into health. They're there. They're there to be used, especially around clinical variation. But uh, that does not exonerate us from taking the necessary steps to get a proper information system. And the world is now preoccupied with the questions of big data, the cloud, stuff that you can't even begin to comprehend that could bear upon quality <coughs> of your clinical practice. And you know, we're not even, we're recently celebrating in our neck of the woods a uniform email system. Well, it was an achievement, but at one level, but my goodness, it certainly left, left me breathless with excitement, I must say. <laughs> email, oh, I've heard of that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there's a heap more to be done, heap more. But I think we do need to take quality accreditation, the dependent as it is, utterly, on information and the information sciences and technology and find a way of bringing these much closer together and advancing both. Because that's where the breakthroughs are going to occur. That's where they have occurred in places that have done it uh, satisfactorily, and mainly North America. So not 
the UK, where they've wasted billions of pounds on information systems that really lead them nowhere. Danny? Uh, look, Cliff, uh, I, I, I think Steve's point about the, the absolute necessity for good information to inform and drive behaviour is a well put point. And we've got lots of examples of, of that. And, and in New South Wales, and particularly in our part of New South Wales, we really do suffer from a lack of well integrated um, information to feed to clinicians to help them understand some, uh, some issues around the performance of themselves and their teams. And I have no doubt that um, with improvement in our organisation of information, that would be of assistance. But I don't think that alone is enough of what we should be doing in uh, 2013 going out to 2020. I do think that we ought to be looking further afield from our own industry into other industries that have really tackled a similar problem in terms of the design um, and performance of their industry around customer or consumer safety, uh, the safety of uh, those uh, of their own workforce, and really bitten the bullet and changed some of the some of the basic design of the way in which they run their businesses in order to drive a much stronger safety agenda in, in, in those industries. Uh, thanks. I'm just going to ask a couple of questions just to get the ball rolling and then I'd like you to chime in. Um, if we can keep the questions reasonably short, you're allowed to make a point, but there has to be a question at the end of it, so please keep it short. Uh, Stephen, you, you, you implied that accreditation could be seen for many countries as an unaffordable luxury. Um, does that sort of go counterintuitively against the idea that this is an absolute necessity for those of us that have got the, the resources? Um, well, I guess it depends on um, what level of healthcare you can provide. I'm reminded of, because um, I've got some familiarity with the, the rural health program in India, that, that um, uh, they came up with the scheme because of excessive, huge maternal mortality rates of training some middle caste women for two days to be chaperones for young pregnant women to make sure that they had their babies near a facility where they could be treated if they had a retained placenta or hemorrhage. And, um, they've managed to reduce maternal mortality. They've got 800,000 of these women now working. Scale is mind-boggling. But um, I'm not too sure what they do much, but, uh, but apart from provide these women with good advice and comfort. But um, I don't know that anybody's actually contemplating crediting that. But, um, I mean, it's still a huge way off. But it, it's all they can do. That's all they can afford. Um, there's not much in it. Um, these women are equipped with a mobile phone and a bicycle. So how do you credit that? I don't know. But I'm using that as a model. I mean, nine-tenths of the world, four-fifths of it, whatever, uh, have healthcare systems that aren't much better than that. So in that context, I think accreditation. I mean, what would you be accrediting? I mean, let's get real. So I think it is. I think it is a product of a reflective, highly resourced, sophisticated system. It's just that when we come to the next step, as Danny said, there's a need for thinking through um, a whole bunch of redesign, uh, which again is part of the Kaiser Permanente approach. We could talk a bit about how they assure quality through redesign, but. Um, Part of the other part is redesigning how we manage information, whether it is assessing what we're doing or assisting people in making informed decisions or reaching out into a community with preventive messages and health literacy. All of those things depend on, on sophisticated communication. So I think accreditation is a bit luxurious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. By and world standards. I mean, sure. not we'll, we'll explore that in a few moments. Danny, uh, when you first talked, you, you talked about the business of health. Yeah. 
Uh, you also said uh, that uh, accreditation has been a management imperative, and you also made the statement that most of the benefits are managerial. But in your last uh, reply, you talked about patient safety, staff safety, and, and, and basic design change. How do you link those two? Okay. Cliff, um, I, uh, I do think we have been progressively moving down the track of a more sophisticated approach to the business <coughs> of public health care over the last, I don't know, five, ten years um, in New South Wales. Um, I think there's, there's lots of examples of us recognising that we have, a, we have a, a, a public policy, ethical and, and business responsibility for ensuring that the health services that we operate are on a sound business platform, and by that I mean that they are that they are uh, uh, well designed from a resource uh, point of view, that they are that they are sustainable organisations, and that we and that we as much as possible drive waste out of the businesses that we are responsible for. Waste in the public sector is as much an ethical is issue as it is uh, an economic issue. Every dollar that we waste in the public health sector is a dollar that uh, we've, we've lost on a on a further treatment opportunity for a patient. I think we've been, I think we have applied a lot more sophistication uh, over the last decade or so around running the business of healthcare um, in a in a in a more sophisticated and effective way. Part of that um, has also um, included recognising safety and quality. Uh, for consumers as well as providers as, a, as an, an, an absolutely integral and legitimate part of the business imperative. We need to get that right to ensure that the experience of the patient and their carers is as good as it can be and that the environment within which that care is being provided um, is as safe as it should be from an occupational health and safety point of view. But, but whilst I think we've become increasingly sophisticated uh, in recognising those objectives of running our business as well, the levers that we are using are only moderately successful. And, and, uh, and I, I believe that there are ways in which we can sharpen those levers in order to, uh, in order to be more successful in, uh, in our safety and quality um, agenda. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to open to the uh, floor if you've got any comments. Uh, please again, could you stand, uh, speak clearly and identify yourself and where you've come from. Uh, questions or comments to our panellists? Russell. Uh, I'm happy to kick off first. Russell McGowan, Consumer Commissioner on the Australian Commission for Safety and Quality in Healthcare. Um, I'd start with the premise that um, national safety standards are a great leap forward, um, but that our um, expectations of these standards in accreditation are unrealistic. And I'm wondering whether uh, either of you believe that one way to disrupt the clinical complacency about the standards that they're delivering uh, will be the sharing of information with consumers and the partnering with consumers for shared decision making as a means of um, enhancing safety and quality of healthcare service delivery. Gentlemen? I don't mind. Um, uh, it, it, every successful business for now and over time has a really solid understanding of the experience of the consumer. So um, I think you're absolutely correct that, that, that the more we uh, um, understand, the more we, the more we routinely include the experience of the consumer, in our understanding of how well we deliver the things that we deliver, the more likely we are to improve those things we deliver. I agree with you entirely. But I don't think it's enough. I actually think on the other end, we, we do need to get the regime right that sends the right signals to people about the incentives and disincentives that will exist in terms of their participation in the safety and quality agenda. By, the, by that, look, look, look at, look, right. if you look at a number of other industries, 
um, there's a couple that come to mind. But if you look, for example, at the aviation industry in America and in Europe, they have formalised compacts whereby each of the each of the groups involved in supplying the product, in fact, bear some of the risk associated with the quality of the product that's ultimately delivered to the consumer. So there is an institutionalised arrangement of including them in sharing the risk of ensuring that the product is delivered well. In the mining industry in Australia, the Australian mining industry is, is, is absolutely top shelf when it comes to uh, the safety of the mining process. Because, uh, you know, more than 20 years ago, they recognised it as an absolutely financial imperative for the business that by controlling for safety, and in large part that was the safety of the worker, they would be able to drive down costs within the, cost within the business. But today, in, in mining in Australia, there is an absolute direct alignment between the ways in which um, uh, the, the management and the workers are incentivised to um, commit to and participate in the safety agenda of the mine, and there are penalties associated <coughs> with their failure to comply. I think we need to be, I think we need to be confident enough, and I think that we need to be um, uh, committed enough to seriously embrace an agenda of formalising the incentive and disincentive regime for participating in the safety agenda. And, and sir, I also think that applies to the so-called contractors into our business as well, because it is often claimed because we have so many contractors in our business, we can't get them sufficiently connected to the quality agenda. I don't buy that. Yes, any other questions or comments? Um, Karen, the CEO of Calgary Hospital and a surveyor. Um, I agree with um, the, the point that redesign is fundamental to improving quality and safety. Um, but I think that it doesn't take very much to point to a lot of failed redesign projects across um, across this state and probably even broader than that. Um, and I think largely that that's driven by uh, the fact that the redesign agenda is very much structured. It's, it's dictated um, as to what will be redesigned and how it will be re redesigned. Um, and that sometimes inhibits um, innovation. Um, but I guess uh, that's a comment. Um, my question is, how do you think that redesign can be improved, um, or that the processes around uh, clinical redesign can be improved to impact on quality and safety? <coughs> uh, your, point, your point about the necessity to allow space for innovation, I think, is absolutely critical. Um, <coughs> Uh, because if we don't do that, you're basically ruling out any form of, um, of, of experimentation, including science. Uh, so we find ways of formalising that within drug trials and things of that sort, and that, that doesn't extend much beyond that. We don't have formal arrangements, for example, for assessing um, <laughs> the redesign of the health system in toto. Uh, you know, it's just done. And um, what effect does that have? Well, uh, you know, listen to the people who are sophisticated, qualitative researchers in that field. I'll tell you it has profound effects. Um, not all of them by any means positive. So, uh, I don't know whether that's... I suppose that's more evaluation, but I would say if you're going to have if, if health reform were a process subject to accreditation review, I suspect it would take a rather different course. Um, so I think you do need to allow space for innovation, but it needs to be um, set within, within an ethical context. And uh, a lot of what we do, with the exception of the introduction of new pharmaceuticals and the occasional occasionally devices. We don't take that very seriously, so you know, people can change things and it just happens. So, so I think it's very underwater. 
just don't know if I just tease that just a little bit more. So do you, do you then think that, that one of the roles the boards have in governance is to ensure that there's an ethical approach to innovation as well as to uh, treatments? Yeah, I do. I think, I think that is <coughs> one thing for which it should be uh, accountable. We have um, Human Research Ethics Committee is brief, could if we wish be expanded. Um, we've taken very seriously, for example, the question of consumer and community engagement, a very complex topic when you get down to it. But the board has pressed for that. And Kim Hill, who's here this evening, has taken a major leadership role in coming up with the strategy that would uh, lead us forward. So I think it's about at that level that, 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 that we can be useful critiques, critics, critics of prevailing patterns of practice. And Danny's made an extremely good point about the lack of um, the lack of quality assurance that carries um, that carries consequences, but it is, is accountable. That's another element. I mean, where the board can say, oh, well, we've got these accreditation processes in place and things to do with assuring quality and safety. What are the accountability measures? I mean, what happens if you don't achieve it? Uh, you know, do you get you thrown out or are you penalised or do you pay 50% of your match fee? Um, you know, we do better in cricket than we do here. Uh, so, no? I, 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 Cliff, just to cut across, I, I, I agree that that's part of the conversation that we ought to be having. That's part of the conversation we ought to be brave enough to be having. And, and it's one that, that I know that people move, a lot of people move up to and then back from because for some reason or another, um, it's considered either to be too hard or we might put people off or somehow another people might run away from their contribution to the business. I, I think I think it is time for us to be talking about what are the incentives and what are the rewards for involvement and participation in a very formalised way in the safety and quality agenda, and what are the consequences for failure to contribute or to comply with that agenda. And it, this isn't this isn't about this isn't about a punitive totalitarian regime or anything like that. It's about just good plain business and being able to speak in a very plain way about the contribution that people will make to showing up for work, doing the job that they have been uh, that they have been contracted to do, doing it to a set of standards that we agree upon in terms of safety and quality, and uh, and the, the sympathy that I have with the woman who asked the question making sure we've got the right measurements in place to know whether those things have been delivered according to what it is we contracted for people to do. And then